Good morning. I'm Tim Nyland. Today, we continue our 2022 market strategy series by deflating the fears of longer term inflation. We're going to revisit some updated charts from last week with deeper historical context so that you can see the magnitude of the inflation fears we are wrestling with. While the inflation argument remains focused on cost push supply chain issues, we have a material economic phenomenon that is tempering the demand pull side of the inflation debate, keeping longer term inflation risks in check. No one in the news media is discussing this factor. We're going to address this 100 pound elephant in the room that no one is speaking about and discuss how this factor is tempering demand push and keeping inflation from getting too far out of control. Before we get started, please like, comment, and subscribe and come back every week for more videos on investing strategy and making the most of Zach's Pro platforms. If you'd like to do the kind of analysis you're gonna see in this video, then you need to have a Zach's Advisor Tools subscription. Just got a few housekeeping items before we get started. This slide deck, these charts, and my commentary are going to be available to you in the form of a newsletter. If you'd like to receive a copy, everyone's welcome. Just go ahead and reach out to us. We'll get that right over to you. Also, the seven Zax Advisor tools charts that I'm going to show in this particular webinar, I've made ahead, I've gone ahead and made them available as default charts uh, under the Zax library beneath the fundamental chart facility in Zax Advisor tools. Lastly, if you find my weekly equity strategy sessions valuable, be sure to mark your calendar now for our next Lunch and Learn webinar this Friday, November 5th at noon central time. My colleague, Zach's Senior Relationship Manager, Meyer Thacker, will offer his latest webinar that sheds light on the question, is your dividend growth strategy at risk? Dividend strategies are, con are considered to be relatively safe, but Meyer shows you that some S&P 500 companies used in these strategies have serious issues. He uncovers a number of the red flags, including interest rate risks, extreme debt loads, risky capital structures, poor capital allocation, and more. Meyer also offers five steps to ensure your dividend income strategy is fundamentally sound and well positioned. Don't miss this session. It's this Friday at noon central, and you can register for free at the link in the description below. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, this is a chart from last week that I've gone ahead and run a 30 year time frame for you to get even more um, more recessions and, and economic cycles uh, visible in the chart. And actually, I apologize. I went ahead and maxed this out. So this is actually a history going all the way back into the 1950s. And you can see, again, that latest CPI read for September 21 uh, coming in at 5.4 percent. Again, this is CPI, all items, including food and energy. And um, and you can see that we've had three similar scenarios play out over the years uh, at this 5.4 that marked a turning point just prior to a recession. And again, I want to remind everyone that it's not necessarily the inflation itself that triggers these types of recessionary events. It's the Fed response to the inflation uh, that triggers these recessions most of the time. OK, so keep that in mind as we're going through this. But this is what has people concerned is this obviously this rapid uh, this this uh, rapid spike in in CPI. Then we get the same confirmation in PCE again all items. This actually was released last Friday. If you recall last week we had the August 2021 uh, number in here, which was about 10 basis points lower. So we ticked up about 10 bips uh, to about 4.4 percent uh, for the September read. And you can see that is, again, a 30-year high. Um, last week, I had a 20-year chart on the screen, and obviously, it was a 20-year high for a 20-year chart. This chart, obviously, going back into the 1950s, uh, you can see that we are, in fact, at roughly 30-year highs uh, on inflation annual reads. Okay, And you can, again, see this confirmation even in the, the difference between CPI and PCE leading into those recessions. It's basically a mirror image for, for three of the prior recessions. So I just wanted to point that out. This is the fear. This is what everyone's afraid of. Okay. And when we look at the demand side, right, it obviously comes down to the money supply. Uh, when we start talking about demand pull driven inflation, the first thing that comes to my mind and everyone else's is this concept of the M2 money supply. This is where we get the traditional uh, uh, measure of inflation uh, you know, too much money chasing too few goods. And if you look at this increase in money supply, um, it's literally just gone parabolic since the Great Recession, right? So post Great Recession, we've literally had trillions in stimulus across numerous QE cycles 
and as of late, COVID aid, pa aid packages that have just literally triggered uh, this this M2 money supply to go parabolic. And you can see, even when we adjust it for inflation, uh, it's still more or less gone parabolic. And so I've got both the M2 series in here, which is, which is not adjusted for inflation, but is seasonally adjusted. And I have that mapped against what we call the real M2 money supply. This is also seasonally adjusted. And this one is actually deflated uh, by the CPI index. Okay, so you can see that regardless of which measure you're looking at, uh, the money supply has just absolutely, it's taken off. And you could say um, that it's more or less doubled uh, in size since, since the Great Recession, okay? And to add further fuel to this, right, you read the headlines every day. Um, I spoke of this last week. It's this concept that this personal consumption expenditures as a percent of gross domestic product has literally jumped back to um, the highest point that we've seen literally since 1950. And again, I've got, um, I've got a max time series out here on the chart, um, you know, call it a 70 year chart, if you will. Um, but these are the highest levels we've seen literally since 1950. So the idea is, you know, do we have demand picking up? And obviously, uh, we've got all the fuel there from the perspective of the M2 money supply. And um, we need to look at this. The best way to gauge um, this expectation on inflation is to look at what's going on in the credit markets. And we looked at this last week. Um, remember that we defined this particular chart here as the 10-year treasury uh, minus that 10-year tips yield. And keep in mind that the, that the tips right now are negative, right? This was the first indication uh, that we've got some significance brewing here in terms of inflationary expectations. And I want everybody just to kind of see that trend of inflation just rapidly picking up. Um, if you take the 10-year treasury minus the 10-year tips yield, minus a minus becomes a plus, 1.58 plus a 0.95 gives you the 2.54. I want everybody to realize that we're still well within that range that we've been in literally for the last 20 years. So this is what we would consider inflation to be manageable, right? We've been here before. We've been here many times. Um, even though we are reaching the outer bounds, we want to see this series obviously mean revert uh, and, and eventually taper back down. We don't want to see this thing break out. Uh, that would tell us that we've got perhaps trouble not only brewing from the cost push perspective, which we already have, but this concept of demand pull, right? We've got all this, this wood sitting by the fire uh, in terms of the M2 money supply, and, um, and we're going to look at implications for that next. So this idea is, you know, the credit markets have literally bid this inflation rate to only 2.54, yet the rest of the, you know, investment community is looking around going, wow, this inflation is just out of control. So the idea is, you know, are the credit markets actually correct? And this is the elephant in the room, right? This is what no one is talking about. And it explains um, why the credit markets have this 10-year inflationary expectation correct at this moment in time. And I want to make sure I stress this concept of at this moment in time because this can change, right? But the idea here is that we simply have no velocity of money, right? So this M2 money supply literally collapsed during COVID and has had one failed attempt at a recovery. And you can see that right here. We had this, this spike up and then it's literally just been trending down, right? So this is trending in the wrong direction for this demand pull inflation to really take hold longer term. Um, keep in mind that the velocity of M2 is the rate of turnover in the money supply, meaning the number of times $1 is used to purchase final goods and services included um, in the calculation of US GDP. So if you consider for a minute the fact that the monetary base has expanded, but the turnover of money has literally been cut in half, well, you can see why perhaps the credit markets might have this right. And this is the interesting thing that I find in reading the Wall Street Journal, listening to CNBC and reading Fortune magazine. That it, nobody's talking about this stuff. And um, the idea here is, you know, until we get some sort of of, of return to normal uh, in this 
in this velocity of M2, in other words, the turnover of the money supply until we get more money changing hands. And what I mean by normalized is just getting us back to, you know, an average level between, you know, what we would call normalized since the great financial crisis, just call it somewhere between 1.4 and 1.7, which is still record lows. Okay. Um, I'm going to have a hard time seeing how inflation uh, is going to embed itself longer term once we get through these supply chain bottlenecks. So this is what I wanted to, to emphasize here is that um, since the Great Recession, and I've got it highlighted here or circled in red, I should say, the decline in the rate of the velocity of M2 um, has offset that increase in that M2 money supply. And keep in mind, this is the M2 money supply um, that is not the real series, right? So this is the one that's not adjusted for inflation, but it is seasonally adjusted. And I want you to see how these two are kind of like an inverse mirror image of each other. And um, this is why inflation has remained in check post Great Recession, okay? Analysts, economists, and forecasters have been proven wrong year after year after year. I mean, we've all been expecting inflation to take off um, ever since we've had, you know, QE1, QE2, QE3. Um, you know, everybody was betting that the 10 year was going to take off and it never happened. And that's primarily because the velocity of M2 just collapsed at the same time that this monetary base was expanding. Okay. So it's primarily because of this chart. And this chart is very, very difficult to forecast. But this is the reason why analysts, economists, and forecasters alike continue to be proven wrong year after year. So we need to pay attention to this particular chart. And again, this particular chart where we map the velocity of M2 against M2 in separate panels, um, this is available in Advisor Tools. Again, I have it saved as a Zach's default uh, chart uh, beneath the fundamental chart facility. So go ahead and reference that on your own uh, after the webinar. Okay. So what would cause this concept of velocity of m2 to move higher right i mean obviously we've got government spending right we've got uh, another several trillion on the docket to be passed for that right so outside of that um, that's what we're, we're concerned about is in addition to government spending what are these key factors that we could monitor using zach's advisor tools um, that would basically tell us if we can expect velocity of M2 to start moving higher and perhaps trigger that demand pull inflation. And the first one I want to point out is the personal savings rate. And what I want everybody to see is what that median trend looks like here post Great Recession. And um, you can see that leading into the financial crisis, right, when everybody was going crazy buying anything that they could resemble as real estate, um, we had this massive, massive dip in the savings rate, right, which obviously fueled inflation. Uh, but since then, we've had an inflation rate on average. It's been hovering, you know, right around 7%. I should not say inflation rate, a savings rate. And um, you can see that during COVID, when everyone was under lockdown, I mean, we literally just were stockpiling, you know, all of our savings um, because we were in lockdown. There was, there was no way to more or less spend it. And um, you can see that we've actually reverted more or less back to post-Great Recession, what I would call a mean or median levels. And so, what we want to look for going forward is this personal savings rate to decline significantly before we get too worried about, um, you know, the velocity of M2 being fueled higher and triggering this demand pull inflation, which would obviously um, trigger inflation more long term. And so personal savings rate, one to keep an eye on. OK, I don't have recession shading turned on in the next several charts because I didn't want the recessions themselves to be a distraction from what's more important, the most important part of this chart is going to be that trend post Great Recession, right? This is what we call the normalized personal savings rate. And you're going to see this in the next couple of charts. So I didn't want you trying to analyze savings rates relative to recessionary periods. Um, it's not as relevant as what we would consider just a normalized savings rate. This is all about pumping more, um, more turnover into the economy in terms of, of the monetary base. So. The next chart is going to be the consumer loan. And obviously, um, we would want to see a lot more consumer loans 
to push the velocity of M2 higher and trigger that demand inflation. And right now, we are literally sitting at uh, a 70 year median level all the way back to the 1950s. We're literally right square in the middle of it. So even though we've got these record low levels of interest rates, we just don't have consumers rushing out to take out loans. And so this is obviously keeping that velocity of M2 suppressed and keeping that demand pull inflation um, more or less under wraps. Can you imagine a scenario right now where we had consumers going and taking out a ton of debt to buy goods at the same time we have this cost push supply chain driven inflation phenomenon going on. The Fed would more or less be forced to, to play their hand and they haven't been forced to play their hand. And one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve hasn't raised rates yet is because they're trying to encourage lending. Okay, Because right now, from the consumer loan perspective, we are literally just sitting at 70-year average levels despite interest rates being at record lows. Now, on the commercial loan side, the scenario is even worse for getting the velocity of M2 higher. And now you can really see why the Fed has left interest rates low because we're trying to, to spur commercial borrowing. It's just not happening. Um, we are well below what we would call 70-year median levels of commercial loans. And this is for all commercial banks. Again, these charts are available in advisor tools for you to look at. And um, this is a max history going all the way back to 1950. And so we need to see a lot more commercial lending. Banks need to lend. Um, consumers need to borrow in order to get this velocity of M2 higher. And more importantly, they need to spend it. They can't just, they can't just sit on it. It needs to be spent. It needs to be turned over in the economy. Okay. So what I wanted to leave you with was for me to become fearful of inflation longer term. Um, I just want to go back one slide here. I would more or less need to see the velocity of money gain steam and revert to more normalized levels, right? So outside of government spending, like I mentioned, I would need to see banks lend at a much higher level than they are currently lending. I would need to see consumers and business alike spending at much higher levels than they're currently spending. All of these are necessary just to get us back to normalized levels of velocity of M2 money supply in that 1.4 to 1.7 range that I mentioned. Until the velocity of M2 picks up steam and in the absence of a significant policy misstep from the Fed, I believe the inflation we are currently experiencing remains more of a short-term supply side cost push issue and will abate over time once supply chain bottlenecks begin to unravel. For this reason, I believe that we will continue to successfully climb the wall of worry throughout 2022, and I remain optimistic overall for the markets in 2022. Right now, the largest risk we have beyond a Fed policy misstep is the inflationary expectation itself continuing to embed longer-term price and wage increases. So the sooner we can clear up the supply chain bottlenecks, the better off we will be as price and wage pressures begin to subside. If we end up in a situation where supply chain induced cost push inflation remains elevated at the same time velocity of money induced demand pull inflation heats up, like I mentioned, the Fed will be forced to play its hand and respond with policy that could risk tipping us into a recession if long versus short term inflation risks are not carefully managed. My intent here is to arm you with the facts and the charts necessary to monitor the inflation, I should say monitor <laughs> the inflation situation for yourself so that you can make your own educated uh, 2022 market strategy. Be sure to request this deck of charts for your future reference. That's about it for this week. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe for future videos. If you have any questions or ideas for future videos, please leave a comment below or email me at tnyland at zax.com. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter at Tim Nyland. If you're interested in getting started with Advisor Tools or ZRS, or if you're looking to upgrade your current subscription, please contact our world-class support at advisortools at zax.com and zrs at zax.com. Thank you for watching and I'll talk to you all next week.